This is the core of our billet four rotor. These pieces have done a beautiful job and taught us so much. But as technology improves and the channel grows, it is time to do something no other YouTuber has done before. We are building our own engines from scratch. Starting with this right here. Hidden inside of this massive chunk of aluminum is everything you see here. And we're gonna have to cut that out inside this shop. This is almost 100% gonna be done in-house with our design, our plans, and if it blows up, it's our responsibility. But this is a major step for us. We've been looking at these saying these are irreplaceable. These are one of a kind, they're done custom, but we've gotten to the point where we are comfortable enough that this is no longer holding us back. We have a lot of improvements we can make, just like I did with the fuel injectors on these. We're gonna take this even further. That's all great talk, but it starts out as this. This is a billet chunk of 7075 T651. This is harder than this aluminum here. This is actually 3003 series, which is very soft, and you can actually see one of the biggest problems with it. As Joel is focused on the fact that 3000 series is harder to polish and make look pretty, that's not my number one concern. My number one concern is the deformation deformation character of this series of aluminum. You can see that under high horsepower and high moments of torque, these holes have all deformed against the steel bolts and dowels that were within them, all the way up to here. Wildly enough, you can actually see that the aluminum housing that Mazda made turns into more of a circle when it experiences detonation. So it's not just detonating out this way, and you can see the force is holding them back in this way, but it's also squeezing in to accommodate for that without just expanding completely. So this motor doesn't just completely expand, it actually deforms. I think our pieces can be a little bit stronger. The biggest concern is this surface here. So what you see is tungsten cobalt chromium. It's an 86104 combination. I'm giving you guys all of our secrets because we are going to try and make them even better. Very big positives, and there are a couple negatives to this surface. As you can see here, that looks like it's worn. It's actually not, that is built up. That is steel depositing under the surface of the tungsten cobalt chromium. 86104 is actually used in a lot of aerospace applications and you can find a lot of documents documenting exactly how it's put onto aluminum 7075. So there's a lot of information about what we're about to do. A Couple different interesting things. One is that yes, this piece is still kind of heavy which that's fine, that's not that big of a deal, but there's unnecessary material in it. So what we're gonna be focusing on is how to increase cooling to the surface so that way the tungsten never experiences over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. The problem is this coating is rated for exactly that, 950 to a thousand degrees, and that tungsten that is thermally sprayed at about 3,000 to 5,000 degrees on the surface starts to delaminate, starts to chunk off of the aluminum. At those temperatures, the aluminum expands at about two to three times faster than tungsten. Say aluminum expands three inches, steel will expand about an inch and a half, tungsten will expand about an inch. You have a problem where if you get this thing too hot, the two are growing at different rates and you will cause the two to separate. We will try to avoid that by cooling it better. And thankfully, tungsten chromium carbide is actually a decent conductor of heat. What's in this center area? not coolant, oil. So we're gonna be doing some more oil modifications to this thing to use VR1's abilities to its finest. Valvoline's coming to the rescue and helping cool the motor even more than it ever has. When it comes to rotary engines, you have the traditional cast iron pieces. The rear iron on this motor was cast iron, the rotors are cast, and so is the front. Now you can see some of the weaknesses to that. You're stuck with Mazda's specs. It is a heavier plate and it does wear unlike tungsten. Tungsten does not wear at all. When you get to about 900 horsepower on a two rotor, or in this case, 1800 horsepower on a four rotor, you start to find the weaknesses in the cast pieces. Now, this is an event that occurred. The motor detonated. And there's a couple reasons why. For one, it's not my tuning, but it was because the plates that are billet swell under heat. And so they pinched the rotors in. So if you're going to run a billet motor, you need to clearance your rotors on the sides more. It pinches the rotor between the plates, causing friction, and then that heat is what ignites your fuel without a spark. And this is actually very sharp because of that. Those were clearance for a stock motor, not a billet motor. So this way, this doesn't look like much, 
but from this way, now we're talking. So Ethan took everything I did and went 10 times over that. We're looking right now at a fraction of the housings we're about to build. The porting was designed off of the billet plates, and here it is on the other one, the front iron, and it looks pretty damn spot on. I've been working on a formula, but then he came up with an even better one for finding the exact shape of the coolant rings, which have been plaguing us for a couple years now, just to like find a good formula, not just make them approximately with a half circle and all that. We actually went through and we were both finding different ways to try and find the best curve because it's not one continuous curve, but it's multiple curves. It's a very actually challenging piece. How do you go from a raw chunk of rectangular piece of aluminum, not destroy it, and get this out of it? Ethan has helped and worked very hard to get his pieces of the puzzle, pun intended, working. Mostly the oil and coolant and all the control rings, the porting, all the small things I had never finished. So what we are going to do first is take a thin plate of aluminum, put it in the CNC machine, hold it in the corners, and half of that thickness we're gonna go ahead and take a small mill bit and go through and basically create this shadow a fraction of an inch thick to see if everything lines up. So this is the thickest stuff I got. That is it even uh, the same size, never mind. Joel almost went to emergency surgery because he almost cut his head on this and that made us all think we're actually gonna use the original aluminum side skirts for the car to cut our very first test of the plates that go in the same car. This is truly a big moment for us. We begin taking it all in-house. We did it all with the fabrication and the tuning. Now it is actually a step bigger and crazier and it's the actual engine itself. We're gonna cut 50 thousandths down, so just a little shallow bit, and basically make a shadow of our potential piece that would go into, <laughs> coincidentally, this chunk here. first version see if it's not just art but it's functionality as well step one is making sure we put the cold side here's the cold <laughs> side don't worry about the depth I just made everything 50 thousandths deep just to see what would show up and there you go there is no tension nice. that is on there our goal is 50 thousandths give or take and this is 58, 59 thousandths between these two right there. That one's in. Right, this one's in too. It's like one, like genuinely one thousandth off. It looks like the slightest bit off. Like it's a little bit down this way, but. Hey, for first try, that's yeah, for pretty first try, good. That's, that's incredible. You could run an engine with all of these the holes exactly where they are right now. I think the only thing that we'll triple, quadruple check is the center bearing location. I see a grip, yeah, used but not as abused. She has a good personality, okay? <laughs> Looking good. Yeah, the sizing's right, that's exactly how those feel. And the sizing right here, that's exactly how those feel. They all have that room, so when it, when it comes down on there, it has room to expand and seal properly. Based on this measurement here, the coolant control rings are 100%. I think we are in business with those. I'm not trying to be cheesy, but for us, history in the making. This is a bunch of different measurements we've been taking over the years and learning all of our motors uh, that has worked well that we are recreating these irons. 
again, we're not the first to this, but what we're going to be able to do will be innovative and build off of the shoulder of giants. We're going to need a couple different special tools to make these even better. So for example, the control rings on our irons are sharp in the bottom corners, a 90 degree flat cut. We're going to go get tools that have a real nice bull nose, like edge has a real small radius on it. So that way we're not creating any stress points on these plates. We're just gonna do it the best of our abilities. What you'll see out on the CNC table is one of the most boring looking things I've ever done, and yet it is the simple stuff that is actually the most complicated. This with four holes in it bolted to the table and within half of a thousandth of flatness. There is a lot of magic going on behind the scenes. There, hidden inside of that, is a rotary engine iron. We want to be able to bolt it to the table in its raw form to be able to cut all of this. It's not that it'll be sitting inside of there as much as it'll be sitting on top. We have a little thing called Mighty Bites. I was able to take our rotary engine, I picked these coolant holes that will allow me to hold this. We're gonna have it upside down, cut the, the reverse, these four holes, cut them, flatten that piece, slap it onto the piece that's in the machine right now, and then tighten all four of these and that piece is now being held from within, now that I've known exactly where those are, I went and created simpler versions of the body. And so I made a prong plug of this. And so that looks like the exact opposite, but it's really not. That's the bottom side of this, and there's three of those there. So that way I know, hey, there's a drill spot here, drill and tap, drill and tap, drill and tap, and then also make room for a nut that's inside there, because you can't tighten this once these are all in there. So I have to like mill out. It's kind of neat because they're in a four quarters, that should hold the piece as even as possible. This was our first version of the cut and it's actually worked so well that this coolant seal has stayed in here the entire time. But the port on this side, we look at it right here and you see the coolant is stained on the spots. So we know that that is a coolant spot, that's a coolant spot and so on. And so I found the most squared off, hold it up evenly type of things, even though these are not even at all, but at least that gives us the ones that we do. Now this thing, if you look at that, is smaller than the final hole. So that gives us room to hold it upside down. It'll basically be sitting underneath here. And then when we go to fix the backside, this is a smaller hole, we can get rid of it. So let's see if we can cut just this base and get them to sit in the right spots and then set an iron on top of it. hammered in. Joel's calling me out and for good reason. I have never tapped with the CNC machine. No, I did it once. The drill bit actually caught on fire because I had set it for aluminum and it was steel that I was yeah. tapping. Nice. Um, but we have 12 of these holes right there and four of these. I mean, I have a CNC machine with rigid tapping, so I'm gonna try the bigger one first. You have the cameraman Joel to thank for what's about to happen. I am most likely going to snap this thing off in my hole. I'm okay with that though, but this is going to thread these four center holes. This machine comes with the ability to tap. So most older machines might not. It's called rigid tapping. Rigid meaning that the whole thing is holding that right in the same spot. So we'll see. That was pretty easy. No, did it break? <laughs> um, do you have another one of those? I don't have another one of those. <laughs> and, just, and the part of it is left in the machine. Let's, you let's just hope. sent it, huh? How do you get that out? Just re-drill it? You'll have to like grab like two parts and pull it back out. Oh man, that's gonna suck. It's going down. Yeah. I can get all those 12 ones done. I'll just go ultra, ultra slow. It popped on its way back up. That's what's kind of funny. Last night really derailed the progress, but you know, you build back better, stronger. We're gonna take a smaller tool that we have no interest in maintaining anymore. Just gently cause it to shatter this piece that's inside of there. It looks so promising that it's like broken in half, like split like this, but no matter what I do with all the different tools, cannot get it to budge. It like wiggles a little bit, but it's because 
the aluminum is wedging it in there. So we're gonna try and shatter it more. I have had broken tap after broken tap. These really small ones honestly are so stupid. If I was doing this out of steel, I'd actually appreciate this more because I'm doing all this in aluminum. So what we are going to do is test this inside of here. Now this is press fit almost. So I actually took it down five thousandths so that way I don't put it in there, get it stuck and it sits too tall. I don't want this metal steel sticking over the aluminum. In fact, I'd rather have it slightly lower. So we're gonna go ahead and put this in here. So please go in. Man, that is, oh, that's, that's satisfying. Very satisfying. Something's going good. Now we are not going to Loctite this one. This one is, we are going to Loctite these. So this is going to make this piece kind of a permanent thing because I do not need my iron mm -hmm. vibrating. Stop right there. Okay, so that feels actually really, really impressive. Now, oh, the whole thing moves just the slightest bit. Okay, we gotta tighten this a little bit more. This is extremely frustrating for me, especially since I'm not even close to an actual CNC operator. I just stayed at a Holiday Inn. Man, that kind of dates you if you remember those commercials. I'm about to lose my sanity, but I have gotten jig number two done. What you're seeing here is basically for the coolant holes that are now gonna hold the second phase of the irons in place. This second phase is actually the one that you guys would see the most progress. Step one is simply just cut off the top, cut the reverse of those four holes. Step two is put those holes onto those pegs and then cut one whole side of the irons. It is actually really neat that this first step is uh, just me alone and with you guys because that kind of brings it back to the roots. With that comes the terrifying realization that it is just me and you. And this is the raw chunk of aluminum that will ultimately become one of the irons. I've got it held in from the sides and we are going to take the surface crust, <laughs> really crusty layer off the top, square that up and then cut those four holes in here as precise as possible straight through. That'll give us the ability to put the other piece back in and flip it and hold it that way. So this is a very terrifying moment. In one sense, yeah, I'm only out 170 bucks if this thing's broke, but it's what it could be that means so much. So we're gonna write the program and as simple as this, just cut four holes. Let's see. Good, bad, or indifferent, this is the very first cut on the very first actual piece. Hidden inside of there is one of my engine parts, and hopefully it makes it to the engine. The coat I'm running right now is just cleaning off the surface, basically making the next surface flat to lay on. Right now, I'm not gonna do anything super critical because it's sitting on top of nasty shit. Once this side is all cleaned off, that sits on top of clean stuff, and so it's got a real nice flat, touch between the two makes the things vibrate less and you can cut more and it looks so much cleaner. It's basically preparing it to be prepared to be prepared. Actually cutting your material, not so difficult. Preparing to cut your material, that's 90% of the work. The coolant was backing up, so I was out running more coolant, but this is the first time I've ever really heavily cutting 7075. It, it's already just smooth, even as it's taking off this weird shit. Super promising. That also means that these little things are holding it. Nice and tight. Fire it back up. You can see my hand reflection, look at that. That was a rough pass. Well, it wasn't rough, but it, it was the first pass. So what I'm doing is just pausing it before we get too far. 0.2 something inches, that's 58 millimeters, which this chunk of aluminum is 55. I hate to use millimeters, but like it needs to be 50. That's the mm -hmm. end result. We've just drilled the four holes and we're going to take them out further with this. This is kind of going to be a scary step for me, but I'm going to bore it with, with not a boring tool, but with this long end mill. 
Um, Sounds so. kind of boring. It's very boring. So that looks and feels smooth. Our goal, and you guys will find out right as I do, is we want it to be exactly 0.56 inches. 558, yeah, there we go. And I'm kind of trying to make it that number, as long as it's not over 5.6 because that's the size of those little uh, the dinky things that I got. The inside's smooth, which means that they'll rip as much surface area as possible. So we're in business to let this thing go to the next three holes. That was kind of a good sign. Blowing this out, I saw something go through the ground. So let's see if the edges of this, and they're all like a little close. I might do one more pass. And the reason why is I need to use the holes on the top side to measure off of. Set the coat to go deeper on the other ones. This is just be a like, light cleanup. Okay, and I have to be very careful because this edge is gonna be sharp as shit. The edges are our very first step on the very first iron. Now we can do this exact same process on all of them. Hidden inside of that chunk is this face that we just milled off. And this is the side we're looking at right now. This is the thing I just busted my ass doing all day. Should be able to line this up. Just like that. Wow. And so you can see all four of these are just slightly smaller than the, my current coolant holes. So that way there's room for slop ultimately. But on that piece, there isn't slop. So we should be able to actually take this off, take the other slab of metal and set it on top of this as a test. Pulling it flat. Oh, they are uh, press. Yeah, I have, some of the, the bolts are in there right now. So they're actually expanding them. So if they weren't in there, yeah, oh, you see that? Mm-hmm. What's going on? Good luck getting it off now. Yeah, true. It, that proves the point. And we'd hammer it down with, you know, like a rubber mallet to get it that last little bit. Look at that. That's... Not going anywhere. No, that is excellent. I'm actually going to live stream to Patreon the next two of these getting cut. But this proves that we can start cutting all of them like in a production sort of way because they're going to work for phase two of cutting this into this. This is three for three. I'm very thankful for everyone at the Patreon that was watching during this process and just supporting me and believing me, honestly. This next phase is just putting them onto that piece and it's gonna probably take maybe two to three hours, wear all that away and you're gonna get turning it into that. It's actually a pretty terrifying first major step. So here we have the last time you'll see all three of these pieces of metal unbroken. This is our stock and it's gonna turn into a front, middle and rear three irons. I have got the jig for this all set up now, so we're gonna take one of them. It's all lined up inside of there. I have it the center of this, so that way we know where these are all at relative to the center of this piece. This is lined up along this edge here, and that edge can't get damaged because I left the raw stock there. So we're gonna always measure this and get it squared back in the machine. So once this goes in, you can't really measure accurately what's going on. All you can measure is the little bit of these holes, assuming that the tool wasn't vibrating, doing weird things. This is gonna be a bitch to get off. You just go and tighten these a little bit. We'll just go to each of them and do it evenly. And they're only putting pressure really on the outside of these walls of coolant channels that don't matter if they deform a little bit. I think it helps that there's a lot of mass in this piece. It's whatever, 40 some pounds. We're not gonna use this big tool and push the piece. I was taught this actually by the guy that made the 12 rotor is that the bigger the piece, the bigger the cut you're making, the harder you're actually pushing on the metal so there's more room for moving it. We're gonna stick with half inch and smaller. That feels like it's stuck to the table. Honor of the Patreon guys that will be watching this, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> this is going to rough out the entire piece from one side. I am honestly terrified, but I have all the guys from Patreon with me on the live stream. The next hour and 20 minutes, that raw chunk of aluminum is gonna look very similar to a final aluminum billet iron. Now this is not gonna be the final cut because I wanna make sure of my reamers and everything all in one move. Listen.
my aggressive cut. It looks way wavier than it actually is. It is very because the bottom plate doesn't have any way of getting liquid or parts out in the back corner you can see there's metal sticking inside of one of them. What we're about to do though, use this monstrous tool to cut the outside edges. So you're about to see this transform into a iron. With a little bit of help from the guys from Patreon, I'm going to redo this cut where it goes down a quarter of the distance, so and so on. You can tell there's gonna be a little bit of a lip left. Thankfully, this is a rough and cut anyway, so even all this damage here, it's way far away from the actual part. And then this shit that's up here, that'll be gone too. the rough cutting. It's so wild to see it turn into that even though you know it's in there and you know how these machines work it's still magic. I think you can see exactly what we're trying to build. I did a finishing pass and I let it go really slow. It took about 20 minutes to do one full pass and you can actually start to see the tool having issues down towards the bottom. I've never seen a, a piece of aluminum come out of my shop looking like this like That's production. Amazing. Yeah it's like production quality. We're gonna do something really controversial at this step is actually the coolant rings. That is probably the scariest part of this. What we're first gonna do is hog out the center of this. That's the last of major material removal. Still gonna be rough cut. And then we're actually gonna do the very first finishing pass, which is the inner and the outer coolant control rings. Ramp down. Oh god. This is exciting. I'll let it do its thing. But I just wanted to see it get down to that level. Yeah, that's sick. That looks solid to me. That is impressive. We can go back by like to deburr these edges. The center is rough cut on purpose. God, that looks like a real piece. I think we can just throw this in right now. It looks like it. We won't get any air in it unless we're doing full peripheral for it. <laughs> I feel like I'm actually assembling a motor. Not bad at all. No. And I can feel it's just raised up just enough. And these are used, so... Yeah, look at the other one. We don't have a port to put the, the cool side on. Wow. It was way too easy. Yeah, that's it, it's got that right amount of rise. This one feels a little low, but we still have to take a little bit down on this. The slightest layer. But that is definitely exactly how it should feel. 
That's incredible. We are about to embark on the most intense step of this entire process. I'm actually putting in a weird shaped tool to help me. If you look at it just that, that makes sense, a little cutter. But it's actually got a shank that's smaller. This isn't gonna hit the sidewall as this goes deeper and deeper into the piece. This is a, my biggest holder I've got. I'm gonna put this tool in the machine, measure it out. Now what we're going to do is we're gonna cut the remains of this hole, both the wall of this and the back of it. And then we're gonna cut all of the correct dowel holes with the big tool in there, all in one same operation. Right now we are officially basically making a statement saying this hole and the following holes after it are all relative to each other. It's like the theory of relativity, it's not the theory of absolute. So this hole is being cut, all the other dowel holes are being cut, and then the final layer of the center bearing is being cut. Because that's all that matters, is the very center of the engine is all in one line. So here we go. Here's the test before we go any further. The whole finish looks okay. It doesn't look perfect, but all that matters is that there's a nice tight connection there, and that is... It's pretty solid. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm dreaming for, is that level of 1,000th, basically, of clearance. All of those holes reamed, I paused the machine right here. I wanna show you what we're about to do. These holes are all smooth. I'm very, very happy with how smooth all of the important holes turned out. You can see, with my fingers at, that's the edge of the bearing right there. And so we're about to take this piece and just bore the outer edge of this smooth and then bore this face smooth. So we're gonna have the place that the bearing sits into smooth, cut right as soon as the rest of the dowels are done. This is the most accurate thing I've ever done in my life. All of these dowel holes are as centered as they can be. They're nice and clean. I can make that code better so I don't have this hanging off of there. But the important part is that they all are consistent and exact to what my goals were. They cut straight through it into the bottom plate. But even more importantly, this center bearing. Now, the only downside is, is that the, in our CAD, we modeled the drain. It's kind of hard to see from this angle, but there's a divot right there where the drain is, but it took that whole side down. And the problem with that is that that actually took down a, the wall that this sits down on. Is it gonna make much of a difference? No, and it's tight. You can see that's also really good. We want this thing press fit in there. And you can see the little gap right there to show you exactly what the machine did. It was my code, but it assumed I wanted that, that cut like that. It's not gonna affect anything, thankfully. And I can't even get it out now. There. 
I don't think that that little divot will play much of a, a factor in this. This is a, a ball bearing inside of it, so it's got more races and all that, especially since this is much stronger metal than the previous one. But there we go, that is the finalized coolant rings, the finalized center bearing position. So this position, that's set in stone right now, and that is the center of our motor. Our goal with these, 065. So you can see 065 was our number. Let's go ahead and go back and then do this one, 065 as well. So both of those coolant channels are now in the correct depth. What we have at this level is actually really quite astonishing. Right? It's impressive, just going step by step because now that means this is at the exact same height that it was on the other irons. So that is correct height. It feels kind of deep, but it's, it is the correct exact height as the old ones. So is this one. All of these holes are perpendicular to this surface. So we can now trust center bearing, these holes, the coolant rings, the flatness of the surface, all together. Now anything else we do to this piece, as long as we don't cut into those surfaces, they're trustworthy. If I take it out, put it back in, whatever else. If I cut the actual coolant through this block on a slight angle, there's no problem with that. The only next major center could fuck me over moment is when I flip this, this surface and the other surface I cut have to be absolutely parallel. The way to guarantee that is we're gonna cut that piece of metal on both sides, and then the second time it's cut, we're leaving it in the machine. So that way, even if the table's off balance, the way that the tool cuts across that flat piece will guarantee that it's perpendicular to the tool. So when we flip it, the piece will be perpendicular to the tool. So when we surface the other side of this, it'll be perpendicular. So basically 90 plus 90 equals 180. So you get a full flat surface on both sides. That's the level of precision that we actually have to do here. Every time I take that jig out, I basically put it back in and re-skim it, or check it at least, before I assume that it is absolutely flat. I'm gonna go ahead and adjust my code so we can get all the other coolant channels done. At this point, if the machine vibrates or anything, it's okay. We have such a beautiful finish. I wanted to show you guys something that is probably the most important thing that we didn't talk about, is that little gap between the coolant ring and that dowel. That gap is almost exactly spot on. Now you can see I went and chamfered some of these holes so you see that little nice shiny edge on them. The other ones have yet to be done. So just to show you how nice and clean that is. And thankfully enough, 062, that's right around the number we were looking for. So what I'm gonna do first is the four holes that are holding this to the table. I'm gonna go in halfway, clean those out. So that way I can then chamfer the rest of this. And then we're gonna cut the port shape onto this surface. So there's really no going back after that. that moment that really seals the deal. We are cutting the first layer of the actual port shape. Bit is trashed shit. You get the idea? The port shape and the tool kind of messed me up a little bit, but I went back and cut it with a smaller tool and realized that the port shape wasn't exactly what we were looking for. It's a little lumpy. I'm gonna go back to my calculator that I'd made, which is actually a rotor, not just the hypothetical rotor, but the real rotor shape and get the calculation of this port properly done so that way I can cut it with math, not just, oh, hey, it's close to how our ports were before. So that's the surface level of that port. And then I also have to approximate how it curves in and try to make that as OEM-ish as possible. When it comes through the side of the thing, it doesn't just kind of do this, it curves like this. And that's gonna change the trajectory of the air and to where it goes into the combustion chamber. It really makes a big difference. Good or bad, I don't know. But the fact is, if I don't replicate that, it's going to be different. And while we're gonna to have to tune the engine different anyway, it's nice to try and say, okay, there's a reason why the air wants to go this way, not just that way. This piece is done. All these are chamfered, all these edges are chamfered. Everything tolerances, specs out. That is a almost usable piece of engine. Once I cut and lollipop this part out, we can take this off the table. I cannot finish this piece until we have that piece turned into a jig. We're gonna basically do all three pieces like this. This will be sitting in the shop, covered under tons of bubble wrap. And then once we make that jig, flip them all the other side and we have 
not finalized pieces because then we'd have to cut the front of the oil holes. But you get the point. This journey is uh, shaping up quite nicely.